Welcome to episode one of Gringle Gone Wild. I'm Rusty Johnson. In this first episode, I'll just give you a little bit of an introduction about myself. Uh, for the past 18 years, I've been an Amazon jungle guide. But that's not something that you just kind of pick up in a want ad or fly down to the Amazon to do. It was definitely a process. Not only a process of, of going to the Amazon, but a process of a lifetime of uh, adventure and studying wildlife. So I'll just give you a little bit of a background of me. So as we continue on the episodes, you kind of have a better understanding of uh, kind of the weird and odd stuff I, I do. Recently, I was a main character and consulting producer as well as the originator of the Travel Channel's Hotel Amazon TV series. I've conducted over 33 expeditions to the Peruvian Amazon. Uh, first to film, to guide. Uh, I apprenticed under shamans and even delivered malaria nets, medicine and toys to children in the jungle where they nicknamed me Tarzan Santa Claus. I had the pleasure of help delivering a baby in the jungle by the light of a single candle, and I purchased rainforest property that now I keep as a scientific research preserve for universities, and I also married a third-generation shaman, which has loaded me up with many stories as you hear as well. I've consulted for National Geographic, uh, the Discovery Channel, Animal Planet, of course the Travel Channel, Dateline. Uh, my Amazon preserve was in Reader's Digest, Must See Places on Earth. And I also filmed in the island of Kauai for the documentary series Cosmic Journeys. Now, over the past 30 years or so, I've bred, captured, trained, handled, rehabilitated an extensive number of species of wildlife, including endangered eagles, falcons, condors, alligators, as well as cobras, vipers, giant pythons, hawks, vultures, owls, tigers, and even elephants. I've had an Indian condor for over 23 years, which is the largest bird of prey in the world has over a 10-foot wingspan, uh, just a majestic creature. Uh, is one of only 10 privately possessed condors in the United States. I've also captured bald eagles for the United States Fish and Wildlife Service for research, and I also trained a really beautiful falcon for the magician David Copperfield. I testified under a federal grand jury pertaining to an Australian bird smuggling ring. I've also had the pleasure, or, or, or not so much the pleasure, of interviewing the infamous satanic serial killer, the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez, in order to explore the mind of the human predator. And with my animals, I've had them on television, such as Late Night with Conan O'Brien, The Today Show, uh, Free Flew a Hawk on The Late Night Show with David Letterman, 14 Stories High over 49th Street in New York City. Um, I even Free Flew an African Eagle in the ballroom of the Waldorf Astoria. But, you know, that stuff I really just have done for fun. Um, really, education is my passion. Uh, so I've uh, lectured at over 3,000 educational institutions, including Princeton University, the American Museum of Natural History, and even the Explorers Club, where I was one of the youngest members ever elected at the age of 25. Uh, but I did all this after graduating high school with a second grade reading level and had no hope of ever going to college uh, due to dyslexia, aphasia, and ADD before it was popular and cool. So what happened is really adventure became my teacher and the world became my school. I also wrote a book entitled Twilight of the Wild, and the forward was written by Jim Fowler of Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, which I've had the pleasure of working with for about 10 years. And the book mostly focused on my adventures through a 3,000-mile trek through five countries I took in southern Africa uh, while sleeping in a Kmart pub tent, uh, filming lions and elephants and helping homeless AIDS orphans. And the book also features my time in the West Indies when filming an active volcano. Uh, currently, I'm developing a TV series, uh, my second one, called Amazon Detox, uh, which will, of course, be shot in the Amazon, but we're going to focus in on healing opiate addicts uh, deep in the jungle. And it's a major, major epidemic we have here in the United States, and a lot of traditional methods just don't seem to be working. But through my 18 years of being in the Amazon, I've seen really miracles happen with the natural medicines that the shamans give in the jungle. So the focus of the TV show is to bring addicts down to the jungle and take them away from their everyday life and their everyday triggers and uh, detox them uh, using shamans and using the uh, the medicines that the Amazon gives us. You know, the Amazon is not only the Earth's lungs and the Earth's air conditioner, but is also the Earth's pharmacy, which in further episodes we'll go into greater detail about. I also work with healing people with the medicines that I've trained with through the years with shamans, uh, such as ayahuasca, 
cambo, which is actually the poison from a tree frog, uh, as well as the venom of the Bushmaster viper and the Fertilands viper. Uh, these two vipers are the, two of the top ten most poisonous snakes in the world. But if you mix their venom right with some other things, it makes incredible medicine. And as well as we'll go into greater detail on that. Um, I also envenomate myself with the venom. Um, I put that in my body about once a week. And what that does is really raises my immunity in case I do get bit because I do go out and catch these snakes. Uh, but as I say, it's a medicine. So there's a lot of uh, good health qualities that, that I uh, result from it. And we'll go into more detail about that in the future. But as I mentioned, this just doesn't start one day. You don't just one day decide that you like animals or you want to be adventurous. Uh, honestly, I feel that it's something that's more genetic, uh, something that you're born with. I cannot remember the day when I really decided to love animals or really wanted to be adventurous. I kind of was adventurous my uh, entire life. Even as a young child, parents had to cut the legs off of my uh, crib so I wouldn't fall out of it all the time because I'd keep climbing out and try to explore the place. So, I mean, from a very, very young age, uh, that was just in me. As far as the animals, the first recollection I have really connecting with wildlife is uh, when I was about six years old. I w walked out my front door and I saw right on the front porch was this dead rabbit. And it was just laying there like it was sleeping. I think my cat killed it, uh, but gave it some type of death grip because there wasn't a spot of blood on it. So it just laid there perfectly beautiful like it was sleeping. So I started patting it, and it was still warm and soft and gorgeous. And, you know, I always enjoyed seeing the rabbits we had in the backyard, but they're always at a distance, and if you ever try to approach them, they bolt off into the woods. So I really never had a close connection with them. But this one, being dead, really had no choice. So I was petting them and holding them and, and really enjoying them. Uh, and my mom comes out and sees what I'm doing, and she's like, Oh, my God, Rusty, what are you doing? And I said it was on the front porch. And she said, ah, oh, the cat must have killed it. Let me get a bag, and we'll bury it. But by the time she came back with the bag, I already had the cat's rhinestone collar around its neck and a leash on it. And I had a pet. At least in my mind, I had a pet. At that age, I had no idea that this thing would decompose. I thought it would just stay as beautiful as it, as it is. Uh, my mom said, absolutely no way, man. You're never going to have this as a pet. I said, come on, please. It, it will not eat at all. Uh, and I'll take it for a drag every day. And then, half laughing and half shocked, she explained to me what was going to happen to this animal soon if we didn't bury it. So she convinced me to bury it. Uh, but that really did stick in my mind. Uh, then, probably several months after that, my second recollection would be I was sitting in my backyard. I saw something run underneath my neighbor's car. I didn't know what it was, so I go under there and I look, and it was a mouse. And, and the mouse had a broken leg. And it was kind of backed up against the tire. So I said, oh, buddy, let me just grab you and I'll put a cast on you and I'll let you go. You'll be fine. And I was six years old. I had no idea what I was doing. So uh, I cornered him against the tire. And as soon as I grab him, he bites me right in my thumb. And he wouldn't let go. Uh, but I found a bucket and a few whips in my hand. He flopped into the bucket. And then I go running home. But I'm happy as can be. Mom, mom, look what I caught. Blood dripping down my arm. It bit me. Can I keep it? And that's when I quickly learned there's two things you cannot say to your mother in the same sentence, and that is, it bit me, can I keep it? So, of course, I couldn't keep it. She said, that's it, no way, you're not going to have it. I said, well, if I cannot have a mouse, then I want a snake. And she did not want to have a snake. She was afraid of snakes, uh, but she also knew that I would nag her about it. She knew I'd always be asking her, why, but why can't I have a snake? If I do this, can I have a snake? Why, 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 why? And so to try to make her life a little easier, she tried to kind of pull the wool over my eyes. Uh, what she did is she said, okay, well, if you want a snake, here's the plan. If you find a snake, remember where it is. Then go back and get your father, and you guys go and see the snake. And if the snake is not poisonous, you can have it. Now, at six years old, I thought that was an awesome idea, so... I just went out into the woods behind my house, and I was looking for snakes all over the place. Never found one. Years went past, I realized what she was up to. And that was, one. Well, it was practically wintertime, so she knew I wouldn't find the snake out in the cold or on a snow pile. And if for some freak reason she, I did find one, she knew by the time I got my father and came back, it would be gone. And three, 
My father never caught a snake in his life. So she figures with all those odds against me, there's no way I'm ever going to find a snake. So about three months pass. And she says, uh, Rusty, let's go to the pet shop. I want to pick up a goldfish for your sister. So I said, sure, let's do it. So I go there, and as soon as I walk in, man, it was like the Holy Grail. It, it, it seemed to glow to me. There was this tank just jammed full of snakes. Uh, they were full of garter snakes. And I just freaked out. I'm like, Mom, Mom, look, there's snakes. There's Dad. They're not poisonous. And with her head spinning, we ended up leaving with a snake and a whole lot of goldfish to feed the snake, um, which I did give one goldfish to my sister so she could have a pet. But I had that snake for many years. It actually sometimes got loose for six months at a time, but always came back. Um, <laughs> we can go into more detailed stories when we discuss that, uh, snakes and stuff. But um, that, again, was something that really, really connected to me to wildlife. So then when the years passed and, and I really was having trouble in school uh, with my learning disabilities, um, it was wildlife. It was adventure. It was exploring that was my crutch that, you know, made me learn things, just learning by doing and experiencing. Uh, you know, my later high school years, I would skip school. And most people would skip school and go and do something bad, but I would skip school and go to a wildlife preserve and take a walk or, or look for hawks or something like that. So it really was my crutch. So after I left high school, I figured, man, there's no way I'm going to go through this whole college thing. I can't sit still long enough, and I'm not going to learn by reading books. So I learned by doing. Uh, I first became a falconer. I really started lecturing, and that's really where I caught a huge passion for it because I could see the reactions of the audience. See, when, when people see wildlife, if they see it on TV or if they see it up in a tree or they see it far away in a field, uh, they enjoy it and they think it's beautiful and everything. But I will tell you, nothing, nothing compares to seeing a wild animal face to face. Uh, and that's what I would do. When I would go and do my lectures, I would bring an eagle. I would bring a hawk or an alligator or a big 18-foot python and have, you know, 18, 20 people up on a stage and drape it over them. And when that audience can see that animal, um, look it straight in the eye, see its individual personality. I'd even free fly hawks and eagles over their heads. And, you know, when the feathers touch them or when they feel a breeze of the wings over their head, that connection is so strong that it's really second to none. So for a good dozen years or more, I did that, sometimes 300 lectures a year. That was a really huge part of kind of the, you know, the, the first phase of my life. And then for lack of a... a Better term, I don't want to say I got bored by doing it, but I just wanted to do more uh, than kind of sit and lecture and talk about the animals. I wanted to go out and, to, and, and do, and I started doing that. So in the next episodes coming up, it's not going to be the Amazon yet, because before that, I had many, many travels before I started becoming an Amazon jungle guide. Uh, one was a beautiful 3,000-mile trek I did through southern Africa, which we'll talk about uh, starting in the next episode. Please stay tuned and thank you for listening to Gringo Gone Wild. Please visit GringoGoneWild.com and subscribe so I can give you a heads up when the new episodes come out. And always remember, in the end, all we have is our stories. Mm -hmm.